here's the question about productivity for programmers, and we could apply this to a variety of other roles, but let's just pick programmers. When would you measure? Yeah, right. Do you measure at keystroke turn? Would, would any of us believe that if we sent programmers off to typing classes, we'd get more, mm -hmm. more code because they can type faster? No, I don't think so. Right. So clearly it's not speed of typing. Maybe we could say it's speed of problem solving. Well, mm -hmm. now we start getting into not just problem solving, but doing it really well. And mm -hmm. if, if, you've, if we've, we've all had this experience, we're trying to solve a problem and somebody says, well, what about this? Yeah. Oh my God, that's a great idea. Boom, 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 right? Yeah. And, and it might've even been a serendipitous thing. They might've even misheard, mishear you state the problem. And they say, well, what about this? And you're like, yeah, yeah, that's it. Or you misheard what they said. But just that, that human synergy that comes from two people working together. And so uh, now the question is, let's measure all the way out at the ends. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What about the quality and maintainability of that software over the long term? I mean, software gets brittle, it breaks, yeah. it has to be fixed. Who gets to fix it? The people who wrote it? Probably not. The people who, you know, came in later as maintenance programmers who don't even understand what the system is it was created. And then you end up with people going in and fixing things and breaking 14 other things in the process. Yeah, sure. And all of a sudden, the whole thing comes tumbling down like a house of cards and you're in emergency land, which was my life. That was the chaos life yeah. I had. So I just was comparing it, you know, I was starting with this thing of like, Rich, you haven't yet seen a, a high performing team create lasting value in a software project ever mm -hmm. in your career, mm -hmm. except maybe something I did all by myself where I was the end to end guy, but there are yeah. no projects like that anymore. Yeah. Right. And so I'll give you just a simple measure, you know, two simple measurements uh, in terms of, you know, how would you measure this? This is a statistic that I can now proudly declare because we've hit our 20th birthday. We've had two software emergencies wow. in, in 20 years. Wow. M my life used to be two a day. Yeah. yeah. In fact, if I got out the door with just two in a day, I probably felt good about it. And now we've had two in 20 years. I mean, how do you measure the impact of that on team morale, yeah. on customer acquisition and retention, on market share, and all that kind of stuff? It isn't about the efficiency of the programmers. It's about the effectiveness of the result that those programmers create. Well, I'm the youngest of three brothers. And we are all, at least at one time, they're a little bit older than I am. Uh, and uh, we're all six foot five. So oh, wow. Yeah. Big boys, huh? <laughs> big, big boys. Uh, and mom would usually have three skillets of pork chops cooking. And <laughs> I think we went through a half a gallon of milk at every sitting. And, uh, and I just remember the conversations we would have around the mm -hmm. dinner table, even later in life when my brothers had moved on, it was just my parents and I. And we always just got into such interesting conversations about Oh, books we were reading, uh, um, things going on in the world. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't, I don't recall it ever being necessarily controversial, even if we didn't agree on things, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. I think is one of the things we struggle with uh, uh, globally right now is Absolutely. we don't seem to be having those kind of conversations anymore. Uh, but we had books galore at the house, and so we always had something to talk about. Yeah, yeah. And are you still a uh, a reader today? Are you always are you Absolutely. always learning? And yeah, yes. yeah. And no, I, I I don't know. You know, I guess probably simply put, uh, authors are my teachers now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. What, what are some of your favorites? Yeah, you about? know, um, back in the old days, and I go back quite a ways. Uh, I was reading books by Peter Drucker on management, mm -hmm. uh, Tom Peters in Search of Excellence, uh, um, Jonathan Naisbeth's book Megatrends, uh, Peter Senge's book The Fifth Discipline on the Art and Practice mm -hmm. of Building a Learning Organization. Those were pretty foundational books for me in terms of telling me there was always a better way of doing things than was customary. Yeah, uh, They didn't necessarily tell you how to do it, but they at least gave you this hope that, which I needed. Uh, there was a few years of disillusionment days in my career. Uh, more recently, books like Influencer by Vital Smarts, mm -hmm. um, The Power of Habit by Charles Dewey, uh, and 
quite frankly, two of my favorite books of all time, uh, Leadership and Self-Deception and the Anatomy of Peace by the Arbinger Institute. Oh, I haven't heard of that one, The Anatomy of Peace. I have to look yeah. that one up. Very cool, very cool. What, what so, so um, you, you had this, this great upbringing and it sounds like you guys got pretty, you know, into some pretty deep, you know, conversations, right? Where you dove in, you know, pretty deep, pretty regularly on whatever the topic was. Um, how do you think that, that, that type of communication, you know, sort of formed how you, you know, how you interact with people today? Because, you know, obviously you're doing deep dives into companies today, uh, and we'll get to you know, what you do here in a minute, but you're doing deep dives into companies where, you know, again, it's, it's very much so, you know, getting to know everything that they do. Do you think that that upbringing, you know, sort of influenced how you communicate to people today? I, I do. I, I think that it was, it was pretty profound. Um, I, if I could describe my dad in one word, it was, he was curious. Mm -hmm. uh, and so he was always in books. In fact, uh, he would drive my wife crazy because she'd bring something up with him. And he'd say, you know, I have a book on that subject. <laughs> and we were going to say that. So he was always reading and sharing what he had learned. And, and you know, what was fun about it, though, was, and, and probably this developed in later years, maybe my late teens or something. Uh, he'd read a book and he'd come to a conclusion or a thought based on the book. And I learned to push back. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he would say, well, I think this means this. I said, well, I'm not so sure. And, and we would have these great discussions. Uh, and again, it was, it felt more like a peer to peer discussion. So I think one of the things I learned both having older brothers and hanging around with their friends, as well as my dad, was I felt very comfortable with people who were ahead of me. Yeah. You know, that the wisdom could be gained from people who seen what I haven't seen yet. And so uh, in many ways, uh, they were also my teachers early on. Yeah. But you also had the, uh, I guess, the mental fortitude to be able to challenge whatever it was that they were. Yep. I was getting know. my own, uh, you know, wherewithal to form my own ideas based yeah. on my own experiences or how I interpreted what I read. And again, I think the beautiful thing was neither one of us walked away saying, I'm glad I proved my point to the other person. Right. <laughs> right. Along the lines of, yeah. oh, I've got some new interesting things to think about. Now. Yeah, absolutely. It's not always about, you know, being right and, and, right. you know, proving, proving the other person wrong. So, so, so what happened next? You, you, uh, you know, you had this great uh, upbringing in that. Did you go to college or what, uh, what was your path? What happened next actually happened earlier than that. Uh, I took a computer science class as a freshman in high school in 1971. Okay. The county in Michigan that I was in school in was one of the first three counties in the nation to offer computer science curriculum at the high school. Wow. Yeah, no, I just happened to be in the right place at the right time. And I typed in a two-line program into a computer that clacked out on a roll of paper because that's the way they used to work in those days. And it said, hi, Rich, because that's what I told it to do. And I was, yeah. uh, I knew what I wanted to do the rest of my days. Uh, by 10th grade, I had entered all the professional baseball players' stats and names into the computer so I could play uh, fantasy baseball with my friends. You know? Wow, wow. And uh, that won an international programming contest. And I actually got my first job as a programmer before I could even drive a car because oh, wow. and um, so I had this beautiful start into a career and I kept working through high school graduation started collecting credits at a local community college but eventually went to the University of Michigan got two degrees in computer science computer engineering and launched a career by mm -hmm. 1982 and um, and you know I've been in that yeah I it's stunning to me to think that September of this year it will have been 50 years since I touched that computer. Wow. First wow. It's so, amazing, huh? Yeah. <laughs> it's like I'm still in the business. My yeah. kids are still astounded. They're like, seriously, dad, you picked what you were going to do when you were 13 years yeah. old. You know? <laughs> They're like, well, yeah, I did. <laughs> That's incredible. That's incredible. So um, you, you, you mentioned that, you know, when you graduated college, you, you launched your career. Is that when you started your first company or is it no, the company? No, I, I started working for a firm here in Ann Arbor mm -hmm. uh, and then switched after for away from that pretty quickly into a smaller entrepreneurial firm. And that one got acquired. It was one of these situations where my desk didn't move, but the name of the company changed four times because okay. of positions. And I worked my way up the corporate ladder. So it was up until I was 43, I had kind of this 
maybe very traditional business life of, mm -hmm. you know, raises and promotions and greater authority and more stock options and bigger title and bigger office and all that kind of stuff. And quite frankly, for, as the way the world looks at success, I had it. Uh, unfortunately, there was this other line that was down here in my heart and I, my heart was breaking for a profession mm -hmm. I thought would carry me for a lifetime. And those data points kept getting further and further apart until, you know, they were at the breaking point and I wasn't sure I could even stay in the profession anymore. I was so disillusioned about the way things were going. Yeah. And, and what was it, you know, about the way that things were going? Was it just the way that, you know, the work was being conducted or what, what was it that really... Probably the simplest word I could use, and I'll back it up with a few pictures of why I picked that word, is chaos. Okay. We were missing deadlines. We were blowing budgets. We were delivering crappy quality. We had unhappy customers, unhappy users. We were, I, was, I was in companies that were building software for a living. And, you know, back in the 80s, you know, you probably, you know, anybody who ever touched a computer with early versions of Windows, Windows would always crash mm -hmm. with blue screens of death. Yeah. Right? And we just got used to it. Yeah. And so, unfortunately, that actually set a tone in the industry that said, oh, that's just the way things are. Of course, software crashes. Yeah. Of course, you lose data. Of course. But as time went on, that loss of data became more critical. Yeah. And, and it felt more demoralizing to have created software that worked like that. And unfortunately, Microsoft had become very successful. And, and, and so bosses around the world would say, well, if Microsoft can do it, so can we. Just ship it. We'll fix the problems later. Yeah. Well, later never came. And after a while, I just started going home saying, I worked hard. I got nothing done. I'm tired. And I don't feel pride in what I do. Yeah. And yeah. I was, I was honestly looking at getting out of the industry entirely. And that's when I was yeah. reading all those early books about management, about, you know, excellence and, and systems thinking and all those kind of things. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> so, so you had, you had obviously a great background um, and you had this, this sort of burning desire inside of you uh, that was leading you away from the industry what what was the catalyst or what, what would you say, you know, really changed your mind to say, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to do this my own way. You know, was there, was there any, some event or something that, you know, made you take that leap? You know, I think back down to your earlier question about those conversations around the dinner table and my, one of the things my dad was great at, uh, it was just delivering these little lines that would come back and, either haunt me or, mm -hmm. or, or support you. me later, right? Yeah. And I remember one time looking, Sheridan is an Irish name and a lot of Irish, long standing Irish names have what's called a coat of arms and it has a little phrase associated with mm -hmm. it. And um, and the one in on the Sheridan coat of arms uh, translated says, uh, the stag at bay becomes a lion. Hmm. So I looked at my dad and I said, dad, what does that even mean? And he said, Rich, a cornered rat fights. So if you back a, a deer with antlers, mm -hmm. a gentle creature most of the time into a corner, beware. Mm -hmm. They're going to come out fighting. And I think that became my spirit. I was that fighting stag who said, I'm backed into a corner that I seemingly can't get out of. This is what's paying for my life. This is, I have, I have a wife, I have three kids, I have a house, I have two cars, I have a beautiful life that this mm -hmm. career has created. I just hate my job. Yeah, my and detail. Scared. And, and so I felt cornered and I fought my way out. And the other part of me is the eternal optimist, which is you stick me in a room full of manure, I'm going to keep digging because I know there's a pony in this room somewhere. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and I think, you know, again, my, my dad was very, very optimistic. My mom was very loving and I just had confidence that I could figure it out. Yeah. And, uh, and that was, uh, that was my goal at that point. I love it. I love it. So, so you, you obviously run your company very, very differently than a lot of other software companies. Um, talk a little bit about some of those differences. Like how do you guys approach a project? What does that look like? You know, all of that. 
Yeah, so the way we organize ourselves is very different. We work in pairs, two people, one computer, sharing a keyboard back and forth. The pairs are assigned, we switch them every five working days. Mm -hmm. And well, this astounds people when they see a software team where they walk into a room and, you know, up until pandemic times, we were all in a big room together. Yeah. Not that unusual, a typical open office environment. But for us, it was very um, energizing to have this space where you have two human beings sharing a keyboard and a mouse together, mm -hmm. collaborating with one another, writing code together. And people come in, point to these pairs and say, why do you do that? How is that more productive? How is that more effective? Why, why, why would people be willing to pay for that, right? Mm -hmm. and, uh, and why do you switch the pairs every five days? Why don't you find two superstars, put them together, and just leave them together? And it creates a lot of interesting discussions, much like those <laughs> dinner table Early days. Yeah. Yep. And, um, and so, uh, you know, we, we have great spirited discussions with people from around the world who come visit us, because that's one of the other weird things we do is, we have tour guests. They come by the thousands every year. We've had three to 4,000 people a year come wow. for the last 20 years, come to see how we do what we do. We also had to create something brand new. And it was, it went to the heart of what we call joy now at Menlo. And that is that our aim is to delight the people who use the software we create. Mm -hmm. Well, those people are the users of the software. And most users are the, the ignored tribe in the technology world, right? We know this because we call them stupid users. We write dummies books for those poor people, right? Yeah, yeah. What other industry could get away with calling the people they serve stupid and then remind them of it by writing dummies books? For yeah, them, yeah. Right? And our fundamental belief was it doesn't have to be that way. We can, why make people think like computers if we can make computers think like, think people. like the people? Yeah. And so we have this practice, a specialized practice of Venmo, not technologists, not programmers. We call them high-tech anthropologists. Their job, go out into the world and observe people in their native environment, mm -hmm. study them, learn the vocabulary, their habits, their goals as human beings. Use that information to design the user's experience and then use our software team to turn that into great working software. Got it. So, so that those are different people that the, the you have the Very software good. engineers and then the, the uh, anthropologists. Uh, anthropologists. Yeah, yeah. 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 So, so getting back to one of the things you said where you switch the people every five days, are, are the people working on the same project uh, and then they're if switching it, to another code? If, it, if it's a larger project, Matt, let's say there's 10 programmers on the project, which yeah. is that unusual for us to have that many. Those same 10 people will probably be on the project week in and week out. I see. Got it. Yep. We're switching the pairs within the 10. And you get a lot of different combinations that way. And what we're trying to do there, there's a number of things we're trying to accomplish. One is keep the energy high and fresh. Mm -hmm. A lot of people get bored and tired when they're just spending inordinate numbers of hours, uh, you know, at the computer keyboard. Um, and, so we want to keep them fresh and energized and maybe like, can you, it's an interesting theme you've started here with the dinner table conversations, <laughs> right? because people are arguing with one another all day yeah. long about what's the best way to approach this and challenge sure. each other. Now they do it in a joyful, you know, uh, uh, compassionate way, but they're trying to come up with the best solution. And then of course, if I convince you it's the best solution, and maybe I just overpowered you with my opinion. Now, next week, I get Bill, and now Bill's in there, and then Helen's in there, and then mm -hmm. Healy's in there. And I'll, I get tired trying to convince everybody that my way was best when perhaps it wasn't. Yeah, yeah. And so we get this richness of thinking, but we also defeat one of the biggest problems in the software industry, the tower of knowledge problem. Most software teams are composed of these narrow towers and everybody on the team knows one particular aspect of the system and nobody else knows what they know. Yeah, yeah. And if that tower is really needed, if they're the database expert and suddenly all the work is in the database, they're working tons of overtime. Yeah. And our belief is tired people make bad software and we, want, we don't want to have tired people. Sure, yeah, no, absolutely. That's that's a really, really interesting way that, that you guys... Uh, you have have arranged this have you so when you're bringing people together i mean there's got to be quite a bit of um i guess cultural fit that you have to go through because i mean if you insert somebody into a team that you know is sort of the the black sheep 
that isn't getting along with anyone, I mean, it's going to stick out like a sore thumb, wouldn't it? I mean, yeah, absolutely. And so we begin teaching our cultural norms, which obviously involve the practices uh, that we've described here, right from the moment of first interview. Mm -hmm. We bring people together in groups and we pair them together during the interview with another candidate. Okay. Oh, then, interesting. And then we give them the weirdest instructions you'll ever hear in an interview. You know, Matt, your job is to get the person sitting next to you a second interview. Help your pair partner succeed. Yes, they're competing with the same position you are. Wow. <laughs> but you have to help. We're going to watch you work with that person. And we're going to look for evidence that you're helping them succeed. Wow. And so we're teaching our cultural norms. And here's a funny thing, because I'm wrestling with this right now. A lot of people ask us, oh, so you are you believe you have an interview that tests for cultural fit. And I used to believe that. Mm -hmm. I'm not so sure anymore. If you look at the eclectic mix we have and even where they came from and what their history was and even what kind of personality types they have, I don't think we're finding people of cultural fit. I think the simple thing we're doing is much more powerful. We are setting clear expectations for behaviors when you're part of our team. Mm -hmm. Amazing how adaptable most people are when expectations are clear. Mm -hmm. And our expectations are simply this. Your job is to help the person sitting next to you look good, make your pair partner succeed. Mm -hmm. And we teach that in the first interview. We, in that first interview, we do 20 minutes. You're paired with one person. Then the next 20 minutes, it's a different person. The next 20 minutes, a different person. And the people watching you are just simply watching your behaviors. Yeah. You might actually, we've seen people literally get better at this in three 20 minute exercises. Wow. Wow. You came in, you sucked. The second time you did okay, <laughs> the third time you were rocking it. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, and people are like, you know, when we, we actually had somebody in our team once say, well, what if Matt can just fake it? What if he can fake collaboration? And my co-founder, who's known for his own uh, uh, amazing one-liner said, can he fake it for 40 hours a week? Then I'm okay with that. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. I like it. <laughs> That's great. That's great. So uh, did you did you think of all these concepts on your own or is this influenced by any other? Certainly it was influenced by Kent Beck's book, Extreme Programming Explained, uh, that he wrote, uh, I think about 2000. In many ways, that book was the precursor to what became the agile software development. Group. Right. But extreme programming, as Kent described it, he simply looked back in his own career as a programmer. And I think Kent and I are probably about the same age. And he was equally frustrated as I was. He just was much better at articulating solutions and possible workarounds than I was. And he said, you know, yeah, a lot of my work has sucked over the years, but there, it wasn't all bad. There mm -hmm. were moments that were shining moments. And he said, what was going on in those moments? And one of them, he said, was, you know, when I really had to hit a deadline and the code had to work, I'd go grab Matt and bring him next to me and say, Matt, come here, sit here with mm -hmm. me. Mm -hmm. Watch every keystroke, make sure I'm doing it right. And he said, if that worked well under crisis, might it work even better if we learned to do it all the time? Mm -hmm. And there were a number of those constructs that Kent put together that I looked at and said, oh my God, this makes sense. Now the pairing thing was actually the part that my brain, it took a while to get around because mm -hmm. natural, uh, well, okay, maybe there's some ethereal benefit, but I'm cutting productivity in half. So this yeah. is gonna double the cost and all that sort of thing. And of course that turned out not to be true. Oh, it's not. No. So what, what, is, what is your, what would you say your productivity level is? I don't even know how to ask that question, but comparatively well, a single person working compared to having the two people so here's the beautiful thing about that question, because you said something really key. I don't even know how I would ask that question. Yeah, right. <laughs> because here's the question about productivity for programmers, and we could apply this to a variety of other roles, but let's just pick programmers. When would you measure? Yeah, right. Do you measure at keystroke turn? Would, would any of us believe that if we sent programmers off to typing classes, we'd get more Mm -hmm. more code because they can type faster? No, I don't think so. Right. So clearly it's not speed of typing. Maybe we could say it's speed of problem solving. Well, mm -hmm. now we start getting into not just problem solving, but doing it really well. And mm -hmm. if, if, you, if we've, we've all had this experience, we're trying to solve a problem and somebody says, well, what about this? Yeah. Oh my God, that's a great idea. Boom, 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 right? Yeah. 
and and it might have even been a serendipitous thing. They might have even misheard, mishear you state the problem, and they said, "Well, what about this?" And you're like, "Yeah, yeah, that's it." Or you misheard what they said. But just that that human synergy that comes from two people working together. And so uh, now the question is, let's measure all the way out at the ends. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What about the quality and maintainability of that software over the long term? I mean, software gets brittle, it breaks, yeah. it has to be fixed. Who gets to fix it? The people who wrote it? Probably not. The people who, you know, came in later as maintenance programmers who don't even understand what the system is it was created. And then you end up with people going in and fixing things and breaking 14 other things in the process. Yeah, sure. And all of a sudden, the whole thing comes tumbling down like a house of cards and you're in emergency land, which was my life. That was the chaos life yeah. I had. So I just was comparing it, you know, I was starting with this thing of like, Rich, you haven't yet seen a, a high performing team create lasting value in a software project ever mm -hmm. in your career, mm -hmm. except maybe something I did all by myself where I was the end to end guy, but there are yeah. no projects like that anymore. Yeah. Right. And so I'll give you just a simple measure, you know, two simple measurements uh, in terms of, you know, how would you measure this? This is a statistic that I can now proudly declare because we've hit our 20th birthday. We've had two software emergencies wow. in, in 20 years. Wow. M my life used to be two a day. Yeah. In yeah. fact, if I got out the door with just two in a day, I probably felt good about it. And now we've had two in 20 years. I mean, how do you measure the impact of that on team morale, on yeah. customer acquisition and retention, on market share, and all that kind of stuff? It isn't about the efficiency of the programmers. It's about the effectiveness of the result that those programmers create. And, and then the other one was we were head-to-head -head in competition with the company. Didn't know it at the time. We were working with a startup that had hired us to build the software for a scientific instrument. And they eventually got acquired by a company that, again, unbeknownst to us, had been trying to create the exact same product inside of their corporation, understood exactly what we we're creating because they were watching our client's company mm -hmm. uh, like a, through a microscope almost. And eventually we defeated them in the marketplace. So they acquired our customer and mm -hmm. they came to us and asked us how we did it. And we showed them the system. And they're like, what? You had two people working on one computer? How much did they spend to do yeah, that? Yeah, right. And I said, well, you're a customer now. I said, they spent $7 million and they're, the, the blood drained out of their face. And they're like, they spent $7 million. And I thought, oh, is that a lot? And they said, no, we spent 70 million trying to defeat you. Oh my God. Yeah. Like 10 times. Wow. And, and then cynically, I never said this to them. I thought, well, no, you didn't because you spent 200 million to buy the company. So you actually spent 270. True. Yeah. <laughs> So you could look at one of either 10 X or 40 X. I don't know what, and you know, and it isn't just about the pairing that caused that to happen. There's a whole bunch of other things that we do that uh, could make that. But I mean, that is, that was the head to head comparison we had that. Um, wow. and, and the interesting thing was they never even launched the product. We had yeah. already been out in the marketplace for three and a half years by the point they bought the company. Wow. Wow. That's incredible. That's incredible. So what were some of the, I guess, some of the challenges that you ran into when you were testing this and, or, or was it pretty well, you know, was it successful right away? Did you, did um, you have speed bumps? So I've done it twice now. Uh, the first time I did it was when I was a VP of R and D at the, this tired old public company that I was you know, in my trough, mm -hmm. trough of disillusionment days. And we reworked that organization from my purchase VP of R and D really changed the whole company. Uh, within, it was working within six months and rocking and rolling within two years. Wow. And I might still be there to this day of the internet in a bubble not burst. So when we started Menlo, I'd had two years of that experience that could be taken away from me. I could lose job and stock options and title and authority and all that kind of stuff. He didn't work in the front door of the building, but they couldn't take away what I had learned in those two years. Yeah. And so yes, there were, were there hard days and pushback and doubts and yeah i had self-doubts during those two years um but uh, when we started menlo we knew we had a system that worked mm -hmm, mm -hmm. 
Yeah, that's incredible. That's incredible. So what, what types of projects? So actually, before we get to that, um, I'm just curious, do you do you still deploy like a like a scrum type mythology where you're out, you know, you're you're deploying, constantly deploying, um, you know, doing shorter sprints, or do you have a different deliverable deliverable process? So deploying is a word I wouldn't choose to use. What I would say is we make demonstrable software every five days. Okay. And the customer will choose when to deploy that demonstrable software to their end users. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we might, we could go two or three years, depending on the nature of the project before it's actually getting, you know, commercially sent out to the world and sold yeah. the product. But along the way, over those three years, we have demonstrated working software 52 times three times, yeah. 56 times. And then the customer is looking at it saying, this is now the right set of features, the right um, uh, capacity of uh, scalability and everything. Now we can send this to the market. Yeah. So it isn't like every week there's a new version going out that could drive people crazy over time. Yep. Yep. Yeah. But you're, you're constantly, you're still, you're still delivering that. Yeah, you we're know. wrapping it up in a nice bundle where all the software works, all the tests are in place, all the, you know, they could ship it if they yeah. chose to. Yep. And, um, and so, yeah, we want to always be in a situation where if the customer chooses to deploy, they, they were ready to do that. Yeah. What does it look like from a customer standpoint? If, if there's a client and actually, I guess that's a question too, is, is what type of clients do you work with? Is it, you know, any specific vertical or industry or anything like that? Um, but what would they, what would they need to bring to the table? You know, if they wanted to work with you? Sure. Yeah. The, um, so if you looked at us through one lens, you'd say, wow, they are schizophrenic, right? They work with startups at one end, they work at, you know, the largest, companies in the world at the other end they work in every domain every technology all that and like can these guys not make up their mind no mm -hmm. uh but you look at it through another lens which is um they are culture focused they are process focused and they are going to delight the end users mm -hmm. and uh and they deliver emergency free software mm -hmm. and so we have one client who's literally told us they said you know we only use you on projects that have to succeed Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Like, well, that's interesting. What projects are you working on that don't, yeah, have, don't have to? Yeah. <laughs> and why are you doing those projects? <laughs> um, but, um, uh, and so we end up working with startup venture capital backed startup companies at uh, one end of the spectrum. And again, some of the oldest organizations on the planet at the other end of the spectrum. And uh, what we need is, um, uh, is play caller on the other side of the equation. We need somebody who can make the decisions uh, because, you know, no organization, no team ever speaks with a single voice. Yeah. And so that person on the client side, uh, we just call them our sponsor. Um, they have to understand how to navigate the politics of their own organization to get mm -hmm. decisions made and that they might bring a lot of people to the table to make planning decisions and what should be in and what should be out and that sort of thing. And there might be conflict on their side, but at the end of the day, the projects that work most effectively are when that person who's heard all the inputs from their side of the equation can say, okay, I got it. I'm making the call. Yeah. And all yeah. of you will be happy with it, but we're doing this and we're not doing that. Yep. Uh, there's no project actually ever gets done unless yep. somebody is willing to say no to something. Yep. That, yeah, that makes perfect sense. That makes perfect sense. What, what are some of the, I guess, the, the, the common challenges that you, that you, you run into? I, I mean, I imagine, you know, when you're bringing all these people together and everyone's trying to say, we need this, we need this, we need that. Um, is there is there a specific um, thing that you found that that you know people seem to, to sort of not necessarily need but they think they need it you know right away? Well, I think the first thing you know, and I would say that what you're describing is almost a uh, a series of things that need to happen from kind of the beginning of the project to the end. Uh, the first one is clarity around the problem that's being solved. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, too often, uh, you know. People come in our door and they'll say something like, hey, we hear you're good at software. Do you know how to build an app? And they're like, yep, we can do that. Mm -hmm. Awesome, because we need an app. I'm like, great, what problem are you trying to solve? And they're like, well, we just described it to you. We need an app built. Yeah. No. Yeah. There is literally no one in the history of humanity who ever woke up one morning and said, 
you know what I need more than anything else? To <laughs> I need a new app. Yeah. Nope, nobody ever said that. And so our high-tech anthropology team is really good at finding out what, what's the problem you're actually trying to solve. Mm -hmm. It's not a new app. Uh, it might not even be technology at all. And that often becomes an interesting conversation with clients because we've actually made suggestions that we don't think you need to build technology to solve this mm -hmm. particular problem. And they're like, but that's what you do. No, <laughs> yeah. we, we are capable of doing that. But our real issue is we want to delight the people we intend to serve. And that might mean doing it without technology um, or high technology, that is. And so uh, the anthropology team leads that conversation. And then along the way, the, the real question becomes, and there's a lot of words these days that people love to use, like MVPs and MMPs mm -hmm. and all that kind of thing. Uh, but, you know, the, the real question is, what is the business goal inside of this project? Yeah. What are you trying to accomplish? What does the budget look like? Because you can have a really big goal and a really small budget. Well, that's yeah. not going to work. Right. Um, you know, that's like, you know, sailing out across the Atlantic in a canoe, you might be able to do it, but yeah. that's where it's a good idea. So maybe a river you know, would yep, be a better yep. place for you right now. Um, and so this, you know, and I think sometimes the challenges we face, Matt, are, you know, people look at us as, as purely a technical team and they're like, don't, don't worry your head about that. And like, no, we do, because mm -hmm. we actually want to see our work get out into the world. We want to see it deliver. Yeah. We want to see it delight people. And so we have some, often some very difficult conversations with our clients along the way about those kind of things. But again, it's all focused, not on we're right and you're wrong, but rather, what are you trying to accomplish? And, and how can we help you do that? And, yeah. and what's the right business strategy to get to your goal? Because if you run out of money too soon, then we're all losers in this. Right, right. Yeah. And do you typically find that a lot of people are looking for, um, I guess, digitalizing internal processes, or is it more, you know, public customer facing, would you say? I would say both, you know, some come in and they're like, you know, we're just a screwed up business inside and we can't, we don't know where our orders are. We don't know where our materials and supplies are. We don't know what the status of orders are and our customers can't self-serve and all those sort of things. So a lot of those become internal processes for how they run their business. Yeah. And, you know, a lot of packaged software, which can be a very viable alternative. We build custom software, which can be very expensive package software, often less expensive, but a lot of times packages almost demand that your business change to meet the needs of the software rather than right. the software change to meet the demands of the business. Yeah. And so we try and strike some middle grounds there between those two, uh, those two concepts. Uh, and then others are like, no, we see technology, you know, uh, software interface to our company is critical to surviving. You know, I think Borders learned that lesson really handily yeah. uh, and, uh, uh, and when Amazon defeated them. So, you know, we get those customer facing ones as well. Yeah. Interesting. Interesting. Um, if if people want to learn I, I, more about you, more about the company, more about your processes, um, what would be the best way to, to reach out and, and do that? Yeah, well, there's an easy way that my publisher would require me to say, and that is that uh, these these two books exist. Ink Joy, ah, Joy Inc. and Chief Joy Officer. I, I would say probably Joy Inc. to begin with, because that describes the the drippy details of the uh, of the way we put Memlo together. They can come visit a tour. They they and the tours are now virtual, mm -hmm. so they don't even have to leave the comfort of their home. They can do it just like you and I are doing it right now. Uh, just go on our website and right on the homepage, it says sign up for tours. They can take classes uh, and uh, and learn about us that way. Yeah, that's that's fantastic. And, and actually, you you made me think of some one more thing too. Um, you you said you know before COVID, uh, you guys were doing this you know doing your your pairing right next to each other. Did you adopt uh, and adapt? Uh, you know, doing that same process remotely. Uh, we did. Yeah, we had been doing remote pairing with our customers because a lot of times our customers want their programmers involved with ours. Okay. Because they want to be able to transfer knowledge. And the best way to do this is have them involved throughout the entire project. So we've been pairing our people remotely with our clients' uh, programmers for seven years. And so okay. it wasn't that big a leap for us to consider all of Menlo going home and doing it remotely with one another that yeah. we just never done it at the scale of the whole company. Yeah. But it, it, we, we had all the constructs in place to do remote pairing. 
Yeah, that's interesting. And so, so since you had such granular information um, about the way that you guys performed prior, what did that what did that remote um, uh, process look like then? Did 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 any anything suffer or anything because of that, or is it about the same? I, I think the team. You know, it's an interesting thing because obviously, as as we contemplate going back, right, uh, we're all self reflecting right now. What did we learn? What worked better? What worked worse? And all that sort of thing. And um, I think the team would report that they didn't feel a loss of productivity per se. Mm -hmm. uh, that everything seemed to work just as well as when we were in person. What they lost was the serendipitous moments. Yeah, we overheard peers that were right near there, and they're like that could help. Or, you know, we have a pretty easy way to go find other people, but it's not as simple as "Hey, man." You know, yeah, so, right, right. I, I describe it as I think there's this uh, small percentage tax, work from home tax that's happening on Menlo right now. And there's a bill collecting somewhere that we're going to pay a price for. And I just don't know how big it is. And I don't know exactly when we have to pay it. Yet. Yeah, yeah. But we're starting to run the experiments come back. And of course, that's as weird as going. In fact, in some ways, it's weirder because the going part was sudden, immediate, and yeah. the whole world had to do it at the same, probably all in the same week. Yeah, right. I mean, no choice. Yeah. The coming back part is a little more voluntary. Yeah, fragmented, and yeah, yeah. And so we're wrestling with that right now in terms of what does coming back look like? And does yeah. it all come back? Does it stay a little bit virtual? I think we'll end up with a different version of Menlo in version three. You know, if version was was 19 years in person, version two is you know, say 18 Last months, year, yeah, yeah. Remote uh, version three will be something yet again different. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's interesting. I, I interviewed someone else a few weeks ago who, um, you know, I never really had thought about this before. You know, everybody's so eager to get back to the way that things used to be, get back to, you know, normal life. Um, and he's like, you know, wait a minute, we just went through something that was unprecedented. You know, what did we learn? You know, let's reflect and, you know, maybe what, like you said, version three, can be you know that much better because of everything that that was learned over the last you know year 18 months so well uh, you're in the same part of the country that i am you get snowstorms mm -hmm, yep. and i will tell you in times past if somebody was stuck out and you know we have people who live 40 minutes from ann arbor mm -hmm. on country roads and they sure as heck shouldn't be out on the road driving and that so they stay home for the day yeah yeah now they'd be like i'm just gonna dial in you know i'll just connect in remotely yeah so i think productivity will rise and people won't have to spend precious PTO time taking a day off because of a snow day. Yeah. Uh, they'll be safer and they'll, they'll probably feel better that they're, they're making good decisions. Yeah. And so I think there's a lot of benefit that's coming out of this. Yeah. And it's, and it's even interesting on the flip side is, you know, so, I mean, I, a lot, there's a lot of companies, obviously that the office isn't going to be there anymore. So that's what, that's where I was curious to see if you had noticed anything, um, you know, without I'm, having that personal interaction. I'm, I'm certainly seeing companies that are making that decision. What I'm seeing more often than not is the companies who are making the black and white decision about you will be back next week or we're yeah. not going to have an office anymore. It appears to me that the, the, um, the response to that from their team members mm -hmm. is equally vitriolic. Yeah. Right? Yep. And so I, I think the, the wise organizations over the next year are going to say, let's keep testing the theory of what works going forward and not mm -hmm. make an assumption that it's all back in the office or it's all remote. Because uh, I think, uh, number one, I think some people, they just need time to adjust. Yeah. Yeah, we went sure. to and said, who wants to come back? And there were two or three people who were like, I want to be back tomorrow. Yeah. And brothers were like, I don't know if I ever want to be back. Yeah. Well, what are we supposed to do with either one of those? You know, yeah. let them know because they, they are either so eager and they wouldn't accept any other way or let them go because they're so cautious. They don't want to do want to be around human beings. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's an interesting, interesting time. And, you know, on, on the other side of it, too, if you if you do adopt more of a remote um, workforce, your your talent pool then expands as well. So we've already um, seen it. We, we've, we've hired 10 people since March, all remotely. Um, and 
you know, Peter's in Chicago and Sam's down in San Antonio. One of our team members decided to move to Seattle with his girlfriend because they always want to live there. Yeah. And he asked the question that two years ago would have been weird, but this time it felt completely normal. He's like, is it okay if I still work for Metlo? And we're yeah. like, of course. You know? Yeah. Yep. And we don't assume we hang on to him for the long term, but, you know, he's, A, he's thrilled that he could move out he there. And, yeah. Him. And B, he'll say good things about us for a long time because we treated him so well. Yeah, no, that's great. Richard, this has been fantastic. Uh, really appreciate the time and uh, wish you nothing but success. I mean, obviously you're, you're doing quite well. I, I'm, I've learned a lot today. I, I, I really have uh, enjoyed the conversation. So kudos to you. Many thanks. thanks. This was a fun conversation.